Tonight, a historic matchup in the race for California's first open Senate seat in 25 years. Kamala Harris, Loretta Sanchez. ABC7 presents the California U.S. Senatorial Debate. Now, from Eyewitness News, moderator Mark Brown. Hello and thank you for joining us for the U.S. Senate debate sponsored by ABC7, the Pat Brown Institute for Public Affairs at Cal State University Los Angeles, and the League of Women Voters of California Educational Fund. I'm Mark Brown from ABC7 Eyewitness News. It's the first time and the only time these two candidates will be facing each other on the debate stage. Let's bring them out right now to your applause, Attorney General Kamala Harris and Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez. I'd like to thank you for joining us and thank the candidates as well for being here. We want to welcome our panelists, Eyewitness Newsmakers anchor Adrian Alpert, the uh, Executive Director of the Pat Brown Institute, Dr. Rafe Sonenschein, and Janice Hirohama, past president of the League of Women Voters of California. Now here's a quick overview of the format tonight. We're going to begin with a long form question. I will ask the first of those questions, and the person to whom that question is addressed will get 90 seconds to answer. The other candidate will then get one minute to respond, and if the first candidate so chooses, she will have an additional 30 seconds after that. We're going to end our first half with a question from an ABC7 Eyewitness News viewer. You will each have one minute to respond to that. And then we'll take a short break at the halfway point. And then we'll begin the second half of our debate with a mix of rapid fire questions that the candidates will have 30 seconds each to answer, plus some long form questions from our panelists, as well as a question from a Cal State University student and another ABC7 Eyewitness News viewer. And then each candidate will have 90 seconds for closing statements at the end. So we begin. Yours is the highest profile race since California voters adopted the top two primary election system in 2010. You are both Democrats. A lot of Republicans and independents and members of other parties say they are considering sitting out the election. Many are undecided. So what can you say to these people to make them actually cast their ballots to you? We begin with Ms. Sanchez. Well, first of all, um, my thoughts and our thoughts should go out to the family of Sergeant Owens, who was killed this afternoon. In, um, in the Santa Clarita Valley, so our thoughts go out to them. Um, this is the first time in 24 years that this state chooses a new United States Senator. I believe that I have the experience to go in on day one and do the job. I have the life experience of a California growing up in a working class family, a daughter of immigrants. I believe that I have the legislative experience. I've cast the tough votes on behalf of Californians and I know how to do it. No on the Iraq War. No on the Patriot Act. No on the Wall Street bailout. They took away our homes. And I believe I'm the only one on the stage that has military and national security experience on the Armed Services Committee. I am a voting member of the NATO Parliament. I have been to Iraq and Afghanistan and the Horn of Africa. I'm married to a retired colonel from the US Army and my youngest son is in the Army. I know what it takes to defend this country. I am ready for this job, and I believe you should vote for the person who can get the job done. Ms. Harris. Um, I appreciate the, the point the Congresswoman made about the, um, the Sheriff's Deputy Sergeant, and um, I was happy to speak with Sheriff McDonald tonight about that. Um, in terms of this uh, election, I agree. It's one of the most important that Californians um, are, are looking at in terms of the future of California. I am a proud daughter of California. Um, I believe, to the point of your question, that when we talk about this issue from the context of what it means to be a Democrat or Republican, that frankly, most issues that Californians care about are not even bipartisan, they're nonpartisan. I have uh, traveled up and down this state as the Attorney General of this state. I have never met somebody who 
um, is concerned about the things that they are concerned about when they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning through the context of whether they're registered to the Democratic or Republican Party. When the folks that I meet with across the state at 3 o'clock in the morning wake up, it is because they are concerned about whether their children are getting the education that they want and deserve. When students wake up, they're concerned about whether they're going to be able to pay off their loans. People wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning wondering if they're going to have a roof over their head. They wake up wondering if, as taxpayers, they're getting a return on their investment. They wor wake up worrying about what is happening in terms of climate change and the future generations right. of their family and their country. And they Ms. want Harris. a leader who knows how to get things done. Yes. Okay. Our next question from Adrian Alpert. And you just mentioned the oh. uh, deputy uh, shooting of a sergeant, but this is about the public attention to the question of police shootings of citizens. Local jurisdictions throughout the country are weighing whether to quickly release law enforcement video. Would you support a federal policy or guideline on the release of such videos? Ms. Harris. Um, thanks for that question. I mean, as you know, I have been a big proponent of making uh, sure that we have transparency in law enforcement. I run the California Department of Justice. Um, and in my Department of Justice, we possess an extraordinary amount of criminal justice and law enforcement data. I decided to bust open the criminal justice data in the California Department of Justice, understanding that there is a crisis of confidence between law enforcement and the communities we protect, and there is a need to speak truth. There is a need for transparency if we're going to have trust. I was proud and am proud as the Attorney General of California to create the first in the nation implicit bias and procedural justice training for law enforcement in the state of California, understanding that we have to take seriously what is happening in terms of disparities in the criminal justice system, the reality of racial profiling, and the need to heal and to improve the work that we are doing. So I am all in favor of what we must do and can do to adopt technology in a way we are more transparent with what is happening in the criminal justice system, including the use of body cameras. All right, Ms. Sanchez, you have a minute. Well, I want to begin by saying that we all know that there is a problem out there, that the trust factor has gone down in our country, that our communities are looking for leadership on this. But of course, when we discuss body cams, my opponent was absent. When there was a bill before the um, state legislature to take the evidence and to take a look at these shootings that are going on, my opponent said no to that. Retired Supreme Court Justice Renozo said, this is imperative to do, even if just temporarily. We have to build the trust back in our communities. And I would like to add, because you didn't give me my 30 second right. rebuttal from earlier, so I would like to take <laughs> it now. Let's not talk. Let's talk about what we're really doing. In my district, just a Sunday ago, most people don't know, but I, my husband and I attend an African, predominantly African-American congregation, and we brought in our Santa Ana police force to service with our church. And then we broke bread, because to know thy neighbor is to love thy neighbor. And so the more we convene, and the more we do so we don't have these issues out there are important in our communities. We have to have local and state and federal and community leaders come together and get to know each other again as community. Right. Ms. Harris, 30 seconds. Well, I think the Congresswoman, when she talks about someone being absent, should look at um, roll call in Washington, D.C., which is named that she is number three in a House of 435 members, most truant and failing to attend meetings. So when we talk about absent, um, I think it is important that you show up and that that's the kind of leadership California wants. In terms of what we are talking about in the criminal justice system, I have long believed we must be smart on crime. To be smart on crime, we need to do the kind of things nationally that we've done here in California in the Department of Justice, which includes focusing on recidivism right. reduction, focusing on what we, we must do to, to create transparency. And I'm proud to have done that work. All right. Thank you. You know, she's talked gonna, to about my attendance, so I would really like to rebut that back. I'm going to give each of you an additional 30 seconds. If you'd like, if you'd like to continue this point, go right ahead. For the first 18 years 
in the Congress, I have a 95% attendance record. Come on, guys. We're at a school. That's a solid A. <laughs> when Barbara Boxer ran as a House member for the Senate, she had a 54%. I have a 68%. But you know what? To do democracy in a large state like California, something's got to give. But I have never missed a close, no. crucial vote. All right. And I will 30 never seconds. do We're going to try to be very strict with time now, because both of you are running over. 30 seconds for Ms. Harris. Um, the record shows that the Congresswoman missed over 70% of the Homeland Security Committee meetings in the United States Congress. The facts speak for themselves. Okay. Now, Mr. Brave Sona Chine, your question for Ms. Sanchez. You have both talked about the need for comprehensive immigration reform. What changes to the current system specifically would you support? Comprehensive immigration reform is the moral imperative of our time. And you know what? The Hispanic Caucus, which has always led on immigration reform, put me as one of their co-chairs of the task force on reform. So I know a lot about this topic. In fact, I first started working on this when Ronald Reagan made a reform, signed a reform. And you know, at that time, my mom was the head of the migrant education group in Anaheim. And she saw that lawyers and shysters were taking the money of people who were, who were applying for reform at that time when we changed the law. So she started filling out that paperwork. And then we would be at home, and my sisters and I would be typing away at the typewriter, filling out the forms of people that were lines around our block because we were helping people come out of the shadows, people who were our friends, people who were her students. And so what would I do? One, we've done enough on border control, et cetera. Now we need to give immediate status to those members who are part of our community. They're deacons in our churches. They are little league coaches. So give them status and put them on a path, if they so choose, to be a citizen. And for time. the future, we your have to completely expired, redo our visas. Ms. Sanchez, your time has expired. You have one minute. Ms. Harris? Uh, California has an outsized stake in the outcome of this conversation. We have the largest number of immigrants documented and undocumented of any state in the country. And it is time that Congress acts. Congress has failed to act. It is time Congress acts in a way that creates a pathway to citizenship that also includes a pathway for citizenship for our dreamers, which includes thinking about our farm workers. I'm very proud to have the endorsement of the United Farm Workers Association. It is about thinking about what we need to do in terms of having a pathway for our unaccompanied minors, work that I have done throughout my career as Attorney General, recognizing that these children should be provided a safe place and we should be providing them with leadership in this country that fights for their needs as we have done. I'm very proud to be supported by Dolores Huerta. She and I have worked for years on what needs to happen around looking at the needs of undocumented immigrants as workers who have been the subject of fraud and notarios. This work must be done, and Congress has failed to act. I am proud also to have the support of Lao Pinon, which said in its endorsement they your, believe I will be the most effective expired. leader on this your issue. Your time has expired. Ms. Thank Sanchez, you. you have 30 seconds. The other co-chair of the Hispanic Task Force is Luis Gutierrez and he has endorsed me. He knows that when he goes around the country and he talks about what needs to do, that I was the one that stood up and fought for you. We put together a six-page menu of things that could happen once we lost the opportunity to push through a reform. And we went to the president and we said, this needs to be done. It is time That's how question. DACA and DAPA Janice. and these other projects came up. There is still so much more Ms. Sanchez, we can do. Your time has expired. <laughs> Ms. Harris. Janice, your question for Ms. Harris. Proposition Boy. 64 on the November ballot legalizes marijuana for adult recreational use, despite the fact that the Federal Drug Administration classifies all marijuana, including medical, as a Schedule I drug. As a senator, how would you propose to resolve this contradiction between state and federal marijuana laws? 
Um, we've got to uh, resolve it, and the reality is that uh, I believe the voters who are going to pass that initiative in marijuana, recreational marijuana, will be legal in the state of California. And uh, on the federal level, what we have to do is move it from Schedule One to Schedule Two. Um, we have incarcerated a large number of predominantly African American and Latino men in this country for possession and use at a very small scale of one of the most um, least dangerous of all of the drugs in the schedule. We need to change it on the schedule and we need to end mass incarceration of young people in this country for use and possession of marijuana. But I'll also talk about that in the context of the work that I've done for a very long time in the issue of, of being smart on crime, saying that we need to stop a criminal justice system that is broken because it focuses only on reaction after a crime occurs instead of focusing on prevention focusing on crimes um, when we know that they're going to happen, which means focusing on our young people who, for the most part, um, when we see that they end up in the criminal justice system, it's because they've been high school dropouts. In fact, 82% of the prisoners in the United States are high school dropouts. That's why I've done work over the years focused on what we need to do to make sure that kids stay in school and we give them the resources. So these are a lot of the issues that come up in that regard, but the war on drugs has been a failure in this country, and mostly because we have criminalized it instead of looking at the fact that it should be treated as a pub public health issue, and we should give folks the resources they need. Ms. Sanchez, a minute. Again, some people talk about doing things. We actually do things in my district. I have been on the forefront of ensuring that medical marijuana, once it passed, would actually have some regulation to it. I have been a fighter in the Congress to get marijuana off of Schedule One. I've been a fighter because, you know what, if you uh, have a dispensary and it's all a cash business because banks are afraid to take your money because we still have a conflict between the federal and the state level laws. I have been one to tell President Obama, stop it already. Let California get this right. In the city of Santa Ana, we passed an ordinance. We eliminated 119 illegal dispensaries, shut them down put in 19 legal ones. We've collected $1.8 million worth of taxes. We hired 30 new law enforcement officers. Oh, and by the way, we unionized the dispensary. Ms. Harris, 30 seconds for you, if you'd like. I think we need to look at the Congresswoman's record on this issue. Because frankly, the Congresswoman, when we look at the record, we'll see that she has voted for policies in this country that have led to mass incarceration of people. The Congresswoman voted in favor of legislation that would allow a 13-year-old to be prosecuted as an adult. The Congresswoman voted for legislation that would out allow mandatory minimum sentences for juveniles. That is not evidence of someone who understands what we need to do to reform the criminal justice system in this country. All right, Adrian Alpert, your question for Ms. Sanchez. Congresswoman, what measures do you support to protect Americans from acts of international terrorism in the United States? Are current laws sufficient, or if not, what new ones do we need? Well, when we look at, uh, from an intelligence perspective, when we look at uh, our threats, we look at them what we call the short term in front of us and what we see from the long term. The short term one, I believe, is the lone wolf issue. The issue that terrorism is being piped in especially through the internet, to um, those who are already in the United States. So what should we do? Well, one, we have to eliminate ISIS. ISIS, and we have to eliminate, we are working to decapitate its leadership. We are working to find its finances and shut that down. And we are doing a lot of, quite frankly, top secret work to eliminate that pipeline that comes into the United States that goes after our lone wolves. Now, there's a lot of issues that we need to work on. Uh, mental health. We put in mental health parity, for example, with um, when we put in Obamacare, but we still haven't been able to really get that out there. We, of course, have to look at the gun use in this country, and we have to put in common sense gun control so that we can bring down the use of available guns to those who would hurt us. And the most important thing is we need our Muslim American community with us to help us to get some of this that's coming in from ISIS. Ms. Harris, you have a minute. 
so uh, we have to be smart and tough as a country. And we need to do it in a way that recognizes the emerging threats to the United States. Those emerging threats include cyber security as a, as a threat in terms of cyber attacks. It includes what we need to do to concern ourselves with cartels and transnational criminal organizations. And then there's the issue of climate change, which is a real threat to national security. And I could talk more about that. On the issue of ISIS, there is no question. We need to go where ISIS exists, and that means going to Syria and Lib Lib Libya and going to I Iraq. It also means addressing it on a domestic level, and that means not playing into the hands of ISIS's propaganda and their recruitment tools, which, in particular, the Congresswoman has helped by calling 20% of Muslims um, inclined to commit acts of terrorism. That is playing in the hands of ISIS and all that they are doing to try and recruit young Muslim men throughout our country and around the world, suggesting that the United States should be an enemy because we do not your, embrace our Muslim community. Your time has expired. Uh, 30 seconds, Ms. Sanchez, if you choose. First of all, that is completely false. You know, over 20 years of doing all types of interviews on radio and TV, of debating, in the Congress, I have learned that your words can be used in three ways. One, sometimes you say something that you wish you could take back. Sometimes you say something that you wish you would have said in a different way. And sometimes you say something that your opponents purposely use politically against you. They your misconstrue time has it. Your time and has that's expired. what Ms. Harris and Ms. all Sanchez, of her cronies your time have has been expired. doing. Rafe Sonnenschein, your question for Ms. Harris. When you drive through the Central Valley, you will see signs blaming leaders in Washington, D.C. and Sacramento for water problems in farming areas. What do you have to say to the state's farmers about water policy in the Central Valley? Right. Water is one of the biggest um, issues challenging our state and our country and the globe. I was just in Modesto last week with the farmers there, having an extensive conversation with them throughout the day. And what we know is this. We, as California, are the canary in the coal mine, and we can be the leader on this issue of water for our nation and our globe. And that means doing what we have done here, doing more of it, and taking it on a, at a national scale around recycling, around what we need to do around conservation, uh, what we need to do around capturing stormwater and storage of water, in particular underground and desalination. We're doing that work here. We need to do it as a nation. We all should, un should also understand that this is a matter of public health. We as human beings require water to drink. It is also a matter of jobs in the economy. Let's bring the infrastructure back, dollars back from Washington, D.C. to our state so that we can build up that infrastructure. Jobs will build up that infrastructure. And then third, this is a matter of national security. Right now, wars are being fought over oil. In a short matter of time, they will be fought over water. Let's let California lead the way for the globe. And let's understand that we must have more reliable and, and, and sustainable sources of water in our state. And we can do that work. And we can do it as a model of the nation. Ms. Sanchez. You know, when the SAC B asked my opponent, what would you do? What is your water plan for California? She said one word, conservation. Period. Period. When they asked her, what about Sykes and Prince Tempest Flats? Would you be for it? She said, I don't know what you're talking about. Now let me tell you about my water plan. Because water is our economy in California, especially in the Central Valley and here in Southern California, we have taken the brunt of what is happening. So, conservation, yes. How about water recycling? The largest water recycling plant in the world sits in my district. I brought back the money to help build that. New projects, of course, we have to convey water and we have to store water when it comes underground and above, like Sykes and Temperance, if they're on the books. Okay. Desalinization, which we have done in Carlsbad. Ms. Sanchez. The largest place Ms. Sanchez. to study Your water is in up. California is UC Irvine. I see it all day long. All right, thank you. Ms. Harris, 30 seconds if you choose. Again, I think that there is no question that California can be a leader on this. And let's understand that we also have to reject a false choice. 
that on this issue of water suggest you're either in favor of a fish or in favor of a farmer. We can do both, and we must have a conversation about water that extends beyond the delta and understands we need more reliable and sustainable sources of water. Los Angeles is doing a great job, as a matter of fact, with its initiative around what we need to do to capture stormwater. San Diego, Orange County are also doing some of the best work in the country on this issue. And again, this is a matter of jobs as well as a matter of Ms. public Harris, health. Thank you. Thank you. It is time now for our first question from an Eyewitness News viewer, Mary Bedford. You will each have one minute to respond. My son, Marcus Bedford Jr., now 41, was 19 when he committed his first and only crime. No, okay. The justice system has hear. failed him in nope. several ways in how he was sentenced. And no one seems to want to correct this problem. Okay, no. They Senate Bill 261 passed so in January 2016, and now Proposition 57 is on the ballot. The California prison system is broken. It is called rehabilitation, but that's not happening. How do you feel about Proposition 57, and what are your thoughts on fixing the overcrowded prison problem? Thanks, Mary Bedford. All right, well, due to a technical problem, our candidates couldn't hear it, so they can't answer. I, we do have it written down here, so I'm going to paraphrase it basically and tell you what she was saying. This is from Mary Bedford, who uh, has a son, Marcus Bedford Jr. He's 41 years old now. He was 19 when he committed his first and only crime. In Ms. Bedford's words, the justice system has failed him in several ways in how he was sentenced, and no one seems to want to correct this problem. Senate Bill 261 passed in January of 2016, and now Prop 57 is on the ballot. The California prison system is broken. It is called rehabilitation, but that's not happening. How do you feel about Prop 57, and what are your thoughts about fixing the overcrowded prison system? You will each get one minute to respond. I will ask Ms. Harris first. I'm in favor of doing whatever we need to do as a general policy around um, bifurcating what's in the criminal justice system and understanding we cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach to crime. We need to make a difference in our minds and in policy between violent and serious crime and nonviolent and low-level offenses. And as it relates to violent and serious crime, there's no question, serious and severe consequence and accountability and lock them up. As it relates to low-level offenses and nonviolent crime, we need another approach and one that shuts the revolving door. I've done that work. As District Attorney of San Francisco, I created a model initiative for the country, a reentry initiative focused on low-level offenders and getting them jobs and counseling, substance abuse, and we turn their lives around and we reduce the likelihood that they will reoffend. That's the kind of work that we need to do statewide and nationally, which is why I wrote a book back in 2008 called Smart on Crime. You can all buy it for about $2.99 on Amazon. <laughs> Um, but we need to do this work, and we have to understand that we cannot continue to form public policy on the criminal justice your, issue in a way that is about fear-mongering, as my your opponent did yesterday. Your time has expired now. Your time has expired. Ms. Yes. Sanchez, one minute. I am against Proposition 57. My opponent wrote the summary of it that we are reading as voters, and she said that it was about nonviolent felons getting out of jail. That's not true. For example, she talks a good story on gun control, but did you know that if you give guns to gangs, you can get out of jail free if this proposition passes. If you do a drive-by shooting, you can get out of jail free if this Proposition 57 passes. If you discharge guns on a schoolyard, you can get out of jail free. So she has failed to lead on supposedly the area that's her expertise. And worse, she has failed to protect Californians as the Attorney General. And as a senator, she would fail to lead and she would fail to protect us. All right, now with that, we are at our halfway point in our debate no this evening. No, there's no rebuttal for this uh, question. Darn. But you can... Uh, <laughs> please? We may come back. We may revisit this. You may, if you wish to uh, address it uh, in response to another question, you certainly can. This Thank is you. a fun debate. We are at our halfway point right now, and we're going to take a short break. We'll, well be back I, I with a lightning know. round. We'll be back. Okay.
allow you to basically finish a thought. We're going to try to stick to time as best we can so we can get as many questions in as possible. If you're a little bit over, if you're finishing a thought, cool. If you're going and bringing up something else, I'm going to stop you. All right. Try. <laughs> oh, I, I will. <laughs> Let's get back to our lightning round. Questions from our panelists. You will each have 30 seconds. For uh, Adrian Alpert, your question for Ms. Sanchez. All right, uh, this one I've asked both of you uh, before, um, but to seek the Senate seat, Congresswoman, why would you give up a 20-year career in the House of Representatives? And Madam Attorney General, why would you give up being a career prosecutor to become one vote in 100? When Barbara Boxer announced that she was retiring, it was actually my colleagues from the House of Representatives, both Democrats and Republicans, who came to me and said, you have the experience. We rely on you. We rely on you because you've been to Iraq and Afghanistan, and you've taken us with you. We rely on you. You know where the Horn of Africa is. We rely on you. You are the NATO vote in the NATO parliament for the United States. You know your stuff, and we need you in the Senate. You're prepared, and you're ready to go. And you know- uh, Miss, uh, okay, 30 seconds has expired. Miss Harris. Uh, I believe that California needs um, and wants and deserves bold leadership and bold national leadership. And one indication of the ability to be bold and to be a national leader is a track record of getting things done. I have a track record of fighting for homeowners of California, fighting for students, fighting for criminal justice reform, fighting for immigrants. And you got to show up. My opponent does not show up. And the reality is that you can have a lot of stamps in your passport, but you got to show up. You got to show up when you're the chair of the anti-terrorism task force at least once. My opponent didn't show up. Not once. Okay, Rafe, your question for Ms. Harris. Would you seek to maintain or reverse the Hyde Amendment that prevents low-income women from using public health insurance for abortions? And please explain. I absolutely am in support of uh, choice and a woman's right to make decisions about her own reproductive health. And I absolutely am opposed to anything that would uh, limit her in terms of the resources and access to resources that are necessary to achieve that purpose. Listen, the bottom line is this. It is very clear, and I've been a fighter for a long time on this matter. We have to support a woman's right to make a decision over her own health and her own reproductive health care. And a society that denies a woman that ability is also a society, by the way, that denies an ability to access to economic health and well-being. This is a very big issue, and Ms. the government Harris, should not stand in the way. Ms. Sanchez, 30 seconds. I have a 100% voting record on reproductive rights in the Congress. People know where I stand. I will always uh, vote and push and work to ensure that women are treated, treated equally and that they um, have choice in their lives. It's unfortunate that in Orange County, California, my opponent actually limited choice for our women. Look at the website of Women in Leadership. Ms. Sanchez, and you will see your time is that explained. she Ms. Sanchez, says one thing but does Janice, another. Your question for Ms. Sanchez. If you are elected to the U.S. Senate, on which committees would you like to serve and why? I have sat on the Armed Services Committee and on the Homeland Security Committee um, in the Congress. I would like to sit on the Armed Services Committee in the Senate. Guys, of the money that the Congress moves in the time that I've been there, between about 52 and 68% of it has gone through the military committee. When we look at the economy of the United States, we need to have someone serve on that committee. Your time is that expired. That and the finance Ms. committee. Ms. Sanchez, your time has expired. Ms. Harris? I haven't thought about which committee I'll sit on. I first want to get elected. Um, but I will tell you that uh, the, the reason I'm running and the work I hope to do includes fighting for the immigrants of our state and passing comprehensive immigration reform, continuing to fight for what we need to do around reform of the criminal justice system, fighting for our students who are here who know that California students are facing an incredible burden in terms of student loan debt. They need fighters. I'm, I'm proud to have the support of Elizabeth Warren and folks who know of the work that needs to be done in the United States Senate to protect consumers. Thank you, ma'am. Now we have a question from a student at Cal State LA, a question from Kayla Stamps. Here she is, president of the Associated Students of Cal State LA. You will each have one minute to answer. This is, I believe, for Ms. Harris. Okay, good evening. Good evening. So I conducted a survey on Facebook about voter cynicism among students. 
Within minutes, the news feed was exploding. This showed that students care. However, there were major concerns regarding lack of trust for politicians, too much money within politics, and the feeling that their vote doesn't matter. Given these concerns, what could you say to students in order to encourage them to go out there and vote? I think that the, the key is this. Um, as with all people who are cynical and who feel that they don't matter, the people who are running for office need to see them, need to hear them, and need to listen as much as we talk with them. And that's the work I've done throughout my work and, and throughout this campaign, listening to our students. I know, because I've listened to our students, that when you put one dollar of investment in Cal State University, you get a return on that investment of $23. It makes sense to invest in our students. I know, because I've talked with our students, that 70% of you are graduating with student loan debt. I know when I've talked with our students that the average Pell Grant is $5,800, but the average tuition on an annual basis at UC is about $30,000 to $40,000 a year. I have heard from our students, and I see you, I hear you, and you deserve to have representatives who prioritize your issues. Thank you. Ms. Sanchez. Talk is cheap. Let me tell you what we're doing where I live in my district. I have this great community gem. It's called Santa Ana Community College. And what we have done there is this year, the entering freshman from our area is tuition free for the year. Yeah, we've actually done it, not talk about it. I carry the Pell Grant bill in the Congress to double the size of the Pell Grant. I carry Another bill that I believe will be passed as soon as this election is over that allows the Pell Grant to be spent during the summer because our students don't always just go in the fall and the spring. That doesn't cost any extra money. I am working with HUD to refinance student loans. So instead of paying the 9 and 10 percent, we can do what your parents do when they refinance their loans down to 3 percent. That's right, what Sanchez. we're doing. Oh, and Ms. the Sanchez, community Ms. college, Sanchez, thank it has four-year programs Sanchez, there now. Your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, thank you. for your question. We are now back to our standard uh, form questions. Adrian Alpert, your question for Ms. Sanchez. I have to turn a page here for that. I have to get back to that one then. Um, this one is a, a longer format question. For profit universities have been sources of controversy in recent years. What action, if any, should the federal government do to protect the interests of students and taxpayers? I believe that any for profit, non profit, private, public, any school that is cheating students or doing fraud should stop existing. But many of the people that I represent and many Californians need these for-profit colleges and vocational schools. Think about the mechanic. The mechanic working during the day and he's trying to feed his family, but he has this dream this dream to become an IT expert. He can't just stop and go to a four-year university. He goes to night school. And the community college doesn't offer what he wants. And so he goes to a for-profit and takes a two-year certificate degree there. So he can change and he can live his dream. Those people who go after with just a brush of all of these Schools do not understand the diversity, the diversity of education that we need. And you know, my opponent has gone after the entire industry, and she is so wrong, because so many people use good schools to get their certificates and their degrees and change their lives. Ms. Harris, you have a minute. Well, on this point, I will agree with my opponent. I did initiate an industry-wide investigation into for-profit colleges, and I will tell you why. Because in looking at them, I found a college like Corinthian, 
who I sued because they were engaged in the most unbelievable predatory practices targeting some of our most desperate and in need young people who just simply wanted to get an education. So yes, we sued them and we put them out of business. Now by contrast, because the voters do have a choice in this election and there are many contrasts between me and my opponent. My opponent took hundreds of thousands of dollars from the for-profit college industry and took a check for $5,000 from Corinthian. I will also suggest this. Part of what our students deserve, and I've put a plan in place that we've called Freedom to Learn. I believe, and I will fight, for the right for students to have free community college, and if your household family income is $140,000 or less, you get free college and university. It's just the right thing to do. Providing our students with an education is the pathway to a dream, and we, if we let Ms. them be in debt, Ms. it'll Harris, be our deficit. We'll pay for expired. it. Ms. Ms. Sanchez, 30 seconds. We're already providing free education, free tuition at the community college. But let me talk a little about that, this for-profit, because my opponent is disingenuous. For example, yes, she went after some colleges after others had gone and already done the paperwork and the hard work for her. But more importantly, Trump University. The most people that got swindled were Californians. She was taking his money in her campaigns to fly around in first class airfare your, and first class hotels and taking Trump's your money. Your time has expired. And your also, time has expired. Your time has expired. Her socialite you, friend in San expired. Francisco. <laughs> your time has expired. Rafe. <laughs> Hi there. Your question. Hi, are you with Ms. Harris. I'm sorry? Thank you. <laughs> In the last what? several days, the United States has ended cooperation with Russia in the conflict with ISIS in Syria after the bombing of Aleppo by Russian-backed forces. Russia suspended a nuclear weapons treaty with the West. What is your view of America's current relationship with Russia today? Is this a former cooperative relationship gone bad, or is Russia now an adversary of the United States? Ms. Harris. Um, I believe that Russia poses a, a serious threat to the safety of our country for a number of reasons. One, um, we know they have an incredible nuclear capacity. Um, we also know and have good reason to believe that they have used um, a, a cyber weaponry to hack into data systems in our country to manipulate um, the election of President of the United States. And I believe we have to take them quite seriously. It actually troubles me when people engage, even in the presidential race, in a suggestion that they would respect Putin more than they respect President Obama. These are dangerous times, and we have to take Russia seriously. It's not only that, it's what they're doing and what Russia is doing in terms of investing in the Assad regime which, as we know, has caused one of the greatest humanitarian crises that we as a globe have seen since World War II. Um, we are seeing and feeling the effects of it when we also have the debate about what we should be doing about refugees and Syrian refugees, and in particular the children um, of that refugee crisis. And I'll also say that Re Russia is posing a serious threat of concern in terms of what it has been doing in terms of Ukraine. So clearly um, Russia is exerting um, aggression and we have to take it very seriously, and, um, and I believe that the, so far we are doing an adequate job, but we have to stay on our toes. Ms. Sanchez, one minute. I believe that Russia is one of the most dangerous threats that we have. I'm the voting member on the NATO parliament. I work with my European allies. I have seen what has happened in Ukraine. I was called recently by some of the generals in Ukraine who asked me to go over and see the front line. They said the little green men are there. And I went on my own dime, by the way, to go and take a look. By the way, our National Guard is there helping. And we were able to deliver a new surveillance system for that border between Ukraine and Russia. I have met Assad. I met him on the day when I had to deliver the news that we were putting sanctions, that the Congress and the President had signed sanctions against him for all of his human rights violations. I have been in Turkey. I have been on the Syrian border. I have been to the refugee camps. I have spoken to the refugees, the largest Sanchez, humanitarian your, crisis your of our time. Your time has expired. 
30 seconds if you'd like. Uh, you can travel and have a lot of stamps in your, in your, in your passport, but um, when you've been appointed to be the chair of the anti-terrorism task force and you don't show up once, that should call into question your commitment to protecting uh, our country's uh, national and uh, security interests. And let's be clear about this. The voters have a choice here in this election on this issue. And it's about who shows up and who gets things done. The emerging threats that are challenging our national security include work that I have done on throughout my career as Attorney General and even before. Your time is expired. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Janice, your question for Ms. Sanchez. Cybersecurity is now a major issue. How would you strike a balance between the privacy rights of Americans and the need to protect individuals and corporations' transactions and records online? At the time when we are most scared is the time when we need to protect our liberties. When the Patriot was voted right after 9-11, I said no. And Snowden showed us a few years later what we had given up. When San Bernardino and the Apple issue, I said Apple has the right to hold on to its lock on that device. So people know where I am on civil liberties. I want to go back to this failure to lead because my opponent has somehow insinuated that I have not been to work. The reality is I work hard every single day 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and people in my district know that. Now, I have passed bills, I have inserted bills into legislation, I have worked across the aisle on issues that are incredibly important. Women in combat, sexual assault in the military, getting rid of don't ask, don't tell, stalking, anti-stalking law in place. When my opponent has been going around for two years campaigning in California, what she has done is through her own crime report, in her smart on crime book, she says her report card is the crime report. Guess what? Gun homicides up 9%. Ma'am, your time is expired. Assaults by gun up 50%. Your time is expired, Ms. Sanchez. While she travels, Ms. Sanchez, your, we your time get is failed expired. to protect. Ms. Harris. Well, there's so much there. Let's try and unpack it. So first of all, on the issue of cybersecurity, um, I am proud of the work that we have done in my office that has been focused on prevention, which is an essential component of what we must do to attempt to be secure. And that means urging everyone to encrypt data. We have been a leader in the state and in the country on that issue. We have done the work. I have done the work. We have done the work in suggesting that also we have to focus not only on prevention, but resilience. After we've been attacked, let's think about our airports, our hospitals, our electrical gr grids. Let's be vigilant in understanding that if they are attacked, we also need to put in place and have leadership around putting a, in place a mechanism to be resilient and jump back and get back in the game. On the issue of, of uh, passing of bills, my opponent has passed one bill in her 20 years in Congress, and that was to rename a post office. So let's talk about what needs to happen in terms of leadership. Let's also understand the fear mongering, the Willie Horton on the crime piece is not going to get it. The OC, the paper in your backyard, just yesterday said crime rates have plummeted. Ms. Your Sanchez, you have 30 seconds. report, the one you said is your report card in your book. 9% increase on gun murders, homicides, and a 15% increase on, gun, on assaults with guns. Oh, and did I tell you a 33% increase in sexual assaults? You said that was your report card. Well, guess what? That is a report card you do not want to show to your dad. All right, now, Ms., uh, we will begin our lightning round. Uh, again, we have Adrian Alpert with a question for Ms. Harris. Would you support a constitutional amendment imposing term limits on members of Congress? And if so, what would be the appropriate length of that term? I think that the voters have to make a decision, but uh, there is no question that we need accountability. And I um, have a great respect for all of its flaws of our system of democracy and our election processes that require candidates to debate and to talk about their position on issues and then let the voters make a decision. And if they haven't done a good job, then elect them out. 
Um, I think we have a very good process in that regard. But again, the bottom line is that they're going to be voted out if they don't have a track record for getting things done. And that's what this election is about. The voters of California want to know that you have a track record of getting things done and that you show up. Uh, Ms. Sanchez, 30 seconds. It's pretty obvious to me that my opponent doesn't understand the Congress at all. In this National Defense Authorization Act that we have before us, I was able to put in 17 different pieces of legislation in the one bill that we do in the military committee for the entire year. So you don't pass a bill on its own necessarily in the Congress. You pass it by putting it into okay, bills. Ma'am, your time's expired. Uh, Rafe, your question for Ms. Sanchez. Uh, President Obama had the first veto override of his presidency uh, in, on a law allowing survivors of the September 11th attacks to sue Saudi Arabia for damages. Uh, the administration warned that this would have consequences for U.S. forces overseas. The Senate voted 97 to 1 in favor of the override. How do you think you would have voted and why? Ms. Sanchez. I'm sorry, you're looking at her, is it oh, for I'm me? I'm sorry, I was going to, I, I presume it was going oh, to you. And you yes, just wasted five Sanchez. of my seconds, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, this bill will, is worked on right now, is being worked on as we speak. Many of us have been on the phones uh, calling and talking about how we change this bill so that it protects our uniformed people in other countries. I believe after the election we'll pass it. My husband is a retired United States Army Colonel and my youngest son is in the U.S. Army. I want to make sure that they are protected when they go overseas Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. to fight Ms. Harris, for our liberties. Ms. Harris, 30 seconds. As a general matter, I support the right that, um, that all people who have a grievance uh, should have access to justice and access to a courtroom. And again, uh, this may present a clear contrast between me and my opponent. For example, she voted in favor of the uh, gun shield law that would shield gun manufacturers um, and, and essentially deny victims of gun violence access to justice, access to a courtroom. I think that's unconscionable. And not only did it, it deny access to a courtroom for those victims, it also wiped a California law off the books. All right. We are now at the point where we're at our closing statements. Each of you will get a absolute minute and 30 seconds. We begin with Ms. Sanchez. Thank you for arranging this debate. I would like my opponent to want to debate more because I believe the more we listen, the more information voters have. You know, don't listen to the establishment. The first election I had, the Democratic Party didn't endorse me, but we beat B1 Bob Dornan. That was a very hard election. I went door to door. A few years later, I received a letter from a truck driver from Garden Grove, Dick Corey. He said, I came home on that election night and I was tired and I thought all politicians were the same and I wasn't going to vote. And then you knocked on my door and you told me I needed to go and vote and that you wanted to help the working people just like your father. He sent me that letter and it's been more important to me than any note from any president. Because in that letter, he said, Loretta, I went and I voted and I voted for you. And you've been doing a great job for Orange County in America. I have fought for you. I have said no to Iraq when everybody was going to war. I have said no to the Patriot Act. I have said no to the Wall Street bailout, even though she really didn't get us more than two cents on every dollar. And I have said yes to rights for minorities, yes to rights for women, yes to small business owners who are working hard to make business happen in California. Thank you, Ms. So Sanchez. So remember this. Thank on you, election Ms. Sanchez. Day, it, your time has expired. On election day, your time has expired. Don't vote for the your time has expired. Ms. Harris, vote you have a minute and a half. And you have a minute and a half, Ms. Harris. So there's a clear difference between the candidates in this race. <laughs> there <laughs> and definitely I think the, is. And I think the voters will make that decision. Um, but this is a serious matter. This is a serious matter. This is about electing the next United States Senator from the state of California. 
And as a proud daughter of California, I still believe in that old adage. So goes California, goes the rest of the country. People still look at us and to us for what leadership and what change looks like. This is an election about who will be a leader, who can be a leader, and who has a track record of being a leader. On many issues that challenge us as a state, I have traveled up and down the state. I have met with folks. I have worked with folks, which is why I'm proud to have the support of someone like Dolores Huerta, or working with Elizabeth Warren over the years on consumer issues, or the United Farm Workers. Working with people every day, I have a track record that has proven what we can do when a leader actually acts like a leader and shows up. So it has been the work of bringing $20 billion back to California during a battle with the five big banks of the United States. It has been the work of providing a path for unaccompanied minors coming through Mexico, where we give them protection, where we give them support. It has been the work of fighting for California's climate change laws, some of the toughest in the country and always under attack by big oil, and yet we stand up. It has been the work of fighting for criminal justice reform, creating models of Ms. what can Harris. be done in our nation. Ms. Harris, thank you very much. How about a thank hand you. for our candidates? Please vote on November 8th.